So I spend my life studying viruses. These are the smallest life forms on the planet, yet they contain some of the most incredible genetic diversity. Most of the genetic diversity on the planet is actually locked up in these viruses. Um, Um, excuse me. So some of the most incredible genetic diversity is locked up into these viruses. Yet the reality is, um, I'm sorry, could we just go back one? And one for the other slide as well. Sorry, I'm going to start one more time. So I spend my life studying viruses. They're the smallest forms of life on the planet yet they hold most of the genetic diversity out there. Viruses are by no means all deadly. In fact, many of them form mutually beneficial relationships with their hosts. These viruses, which infect bacteria, um, are so numerous that if you added all of them up, they would equal the weight of a million blue whales. Um, a virologist could easily spend their entire life studying these things and have many things left to do. Yet the ultimate objective for virologists at this moment in history is actually to understand pandemics, how they're born, and how to detect and stop them before they spread. We live in a period of unprecedented threat from microbes, a threat that is increasing at an explosive rate. Yet it wasn't always like this. In the next 15 minutes, I'm actually going to take you on a tour of the last seven million years of history and talk about some of the events that led to the pandemic explosion that we're currently experiencing. And because this is TED, I'm gonna actually emphasize some of the technological and innovative elements of this, of this particular period. Effectively, I'm gonna give you the techies tour of pandemics over the last seven million years. This is a story with, it starts with the common ancestor of humans and chimpanzees. Um, an animal like this was responsible for one of the most fundamental innovations in human history, and that's hunting. This is a behavior that continues in all of the descendants of this animal. In the early 90s, I worked with uh, ch wild chimpanzees just like these. Like humans, chimpanzees like to hunt. These chimps are eating a monkey that they recently captured. The story of infectious diseases is actually one of interconnectivity, and this is one of these fundamental activities that creates interconnectivity. As they hunt, they have contact with all the blood and body fluids of these animals. All of these things have the potential to enter into them, fundamentally changing them. This is sort of a microbial Pandora's box, if you will. They always seem to put me um, before dinner. <laughs> um, when chimpanzees look at these animals, when we look at these animals, we see sort of a cuddly primate. When chimpanzees look at them, they see something more along the lines of lamb chops. Eons ago, viruses from each of these different species entered into chimpanzees who had actually hunted these animals. These viruses combined with each other to form a new virus infecting chimpanzees, and that virus actually ended up crossing over into humans, and that was HIV. So the hunting has a really profound element and impact. So sometime after our lineage and the chimpanzee lineage split, we actually learned to cook. This is a 30,000-year-old kitchen. But cooking goes back much further. Cooking is, is absolutely fundamental. It frees food from microbes. And now cooking is, is pretty much nearly universal among human populations. Uh, nearly universal. <laughs> and Ozzy, I don't know if you're out there, but if so, I definitely would like a blood sample. So around 70,000 years ago, evidence shows, you know, genetic evidence of comparing human populations shows that in fact we went through a very severe population bottleneck. Effectively, we became an endangered species. So when population sizes are radically reduced, some things get left behind. Okay, so if you think of these marbles as being genes, effectively during a population bottleneck, you're gonna lose quite a bit of this diversity. And this is one of the reasons why endangered species are often inbred. But in fact, if you think of these marbles not as genes, but in fact as microbes, you get exactly the same phenomena. So you lose some of the microbes during this, this bottleneck event. And when you lose the, the microbes, you also lose some of the genetic defenses against microbes. So effectively, 70,000 years ago, when we became endangered species, 
we went through this period where we became defenseless against some of the microbes. We lost many of our microbes. And this was a critical moment for us. This was right before a series of innovations would occur that would fundamentally change us forever. The first of these innovations that I'd like to talk about, um, and this is started about 20,000 years ago, is domestication. Now, domestication fundamentally remolds our reality. It changes everything about the way that we interact with the world. When we start surrounding ourselves with animals, we invite the viruses of those animals into our own population. But much more so than that, these animals become incubators, they become amplifiers, and they become bridges for microbes from wild animals, which will cross through domestic animals into human populations. And this is something which continues to this date. Um, Another interesting is domestication gave us surplus. And this permitted populations to live in interconnected settlements. The network of emerging towns which actually emerged created large populations, and large populations end up fueling the fire of pandemics. So domestication, in effect, led to a microbial renaissance, if you will, with new bugs spreading in vulnerable and rapid, rapidly growing populations. Biological interconnectivity would sort of reach its zenith some thousands of years later. Um, and certainly, medical technology saves lives, but in some of the next slides, I'm going to show you ways that it actually facilitates the spread of microorganisms. When used improperly, these kinds of things can kill. Needles create novel ways of connecting individuals, and again, the sort of interconnectivity between individuals is king. So these kind of things allow for the transmission of viruses like HIV and HCV. Vaccine campaigns. Now, vaccine campaigns obviously save lives, and they have in, for the last 30 years. But smallpox and schistosomiasis vaccine campaigns that were conducted decades ago would often line 1,000 individuals up and use the same needle to immunize person after person after person. And this led to you know, fundamental and important transmission of viruses like hepatitis C virus. In addition, some of the polio vaccine lots were grown on the liver of macaques. And by growing them on the liver of macaques, it permitted the transmission of a virus called SV40, which infects probably 100,000 individuals um, in the world today, including probably some individuals in this, in, this, in this particular audience. Other medical technologies, blood transfusion, transplantation, you get the idea. These are all ways of connecting human populations in ways that we haven't been connected before. Um, they reached a, a pretty interesting and somewhat bizarre climax in this picture here. And if you look on the right side, you'll see a, a, a character named uh, Sergei Voronov. And this was, this was not, not, not planned in, in any way. But Sergei Voronov was a fascinating character who, um, he was a surgeon, a Russian surgeon who lived in Paris. And he specialized in transplanting animal livers into human populations. He transplanted thousands of, of, of uh, animal uh, organs into human populations, and in one of his sort of really most, most fascinating and, and complicated experiments um, from the perspective of public health, he transplanted chimpanzee testicles into males as a, as a virility treatment. Now these, of course, are all things that, that um, were just sort of a moment in time, but from the perspective of a microbe, this creates tremendous possibilities for cross-species transmission. Perhaps the most important and critical event in human history was actually the advent of mass transportation. Planes, trains, ships, automobiles, these all connect global human populations and animal populations in a way that's completely unprecedented in the history of life on our planet. From a virus's perspective, there is only a single mass of humans vulnerable to pandemics, whether they're natural or the results of bioterror or even bioerror. Along with our animals, we now represent this single massive viral mixing vessel that viruses that enter into any point of the cycle have the capacity to spread anywhere in the world. We've passed a major tympic point with regards to these sorts of diseases, HIV, SARS, influenza. These are just a few of the plagues of the modern pandemic age. And all of them emerge through this sort of hyperconnectivity that you see. Technologically driven interconnectivity has created a perfect storm for the emergence of pandemics. But these same forces also have the potential to save us. The real question is which of these will end up prevailing. 
Uh, I love this slide. This is actually the first geographic information system. The pioneering British epidemiologist John Snow created this GIS in 1854 by layering cholera data and water data on a map of London. Snow saw that cholera cases clustered with water sources, and he famously removed the handle on the Broad Street water pump, successfully stopping the spread of the disease. At TED in 2009, I announced the formation of an independent research institute, Global Viral Forecasting. We have only one mission, and that mission is to detect pandemics early and to stop them before they spread. We have a proven model based on 12 years of international work establishing viral listening posts to disease hotspots throughout the world. The idea is to build on the tradition that Jon Snow started, adding new data layers of human and animal viruses to a growing GIS, outbreak GIS. In 2009, I showed you a slide of the sites we were working in. I'm happy to say that here's where we are now. We've leveraged support from the Skoll Foundation and Google.org with additional partners from USAID, DOD, NIH, DHS, the State Department, and others, we now work with a global group of colleagues, some from Wildlife Trust and HealthMap are here in this audience, to scour the globe for new pandemics before they strike. This is what we've done. In the last 12 years, we've assembled some of the most comprehensive sample sets of human and animal collections in the world providing a critical baseline to this exercise. We now monitor the flow of viruses into the human population. We can witness the moment at which outbreaks are born. But this is really not enough. We are now moving quickly to bring new technologies to the problem, technologies that will ultimately change the way that epidemiology is done. Fortunately, connectivity is a double-edged sword when it comes to pandemics. Technology is no longer biological interconnectedness alone. It is also digital interconnectedness. The same forces that drove us into the pandemic age can also help solve the problem. For example, now we can analyze search patterns looking for keywords like fever or rash. Our colleagues at Google.org have done this with really incredible success, showing that digital surveillance can at times be even more effective than traditional forms of surveillance. But in fact, that's just the beginning. Right now, every one of you in this audience has been planted with a locating device, a device that tracks your exact moments everywhere you are at every moment. You may have guessed it's your cell phone. Call data records constantly recall, record your whereabouts wherever you are. Um, there's, a, there's a wonderful Silicon Valley legend about one of the pioneers of call data uh, records, which actually suggests that um, this individual said in front of an audience that if he had all this information, he could basically tell who in an audience was having affairs. Now, I'm not sure why you'd want to do that, but the point is, is I think if you can detect who's cheating, then you can also detect who's sick, perhaps by telling who's in what place at what time are you at home when you're supposed to be at work. And this is a, a, an important piece of information that we can add to this sort of outbreak collection. The Facebook phenomena likewise has contributed to one of the richest social graphs of human connections in the world. But it also has the potential to help us map the networks through which diseases are likely to be able to spread. I think it's worth taking just a short digression here. If you look at the media over the last week or so, there's been a lot of discussion about um, sort of issues of privacy. And I think that these have been painted in a very unfair dichotomy. It's sort of like the white knights of, pri of privacy versus individuals at corporations who'd like to steal your data and make as much money as they possibly can. And I think we need to break this problem down in a fundamentally different way. I would actually say that 20 years from now, very few of us are going to care if people know how much toothpaste, you know, what kind of toothpaste we use or who our friends are. But you can disagree with me on that point. Uh, the point that I think is absolutely central is big data has incredible capacity uh, for public health. We're going through this massive big data revolution, and we need to find ways to uh, allow people to free this data and to make it accessible so that we can understand it and add it to some of these models. Um, I have to say that I'm, I'm, I'm not a Facebook user, but I am a Twitter user. So if you think of search patterns as being able to tell us what it is that people want, or what, are, what people are looking for, if you think of called data records as telling us about where people uh, are, then Facebook tells us where pe how people are connected, and Twitter potentially can tell us what people are thinking and, and, and potentially where they're going. A recent paper apparently showed that Twitter activity is 
uh, can you be used to predict the Dow Jones Industrial Average? And if that's the case, then certainly it should be able to predict uh, patterns of illness. Right now, we sort of, again, we live in this incredible moment where we have a tremendous amount of data. We are interconnected biologically in a way that drives these pandemics, but we're also interconnected digitally in a way that provides data that we've never seen before. Um, and there's really, I've provided just a few examples. There's many, many more examples. If you think of what are the patterns with which people are actually purchasing over-the-counter drugs, for example, that's one of them. What about electronic medical records? These are all points of data that are potentially very important. Um, and basically what, now, what we're now doing is accumulating these data sources and creating what we're, we're calling right now the, the sort of massive outbreak data mashup. And we'd like to invite you to join us in this exercise. If any of you have data sources that you think might be of interest, please let us know. This email goes directly to Lucky Gunasakara, who's heading up this particular effort for our work. The internet is sometimes called the global nervous system. And our hope is that we're now seeing the beginnings of what may one day be called the global immune system. This is certainly not a trivial need. This month, just this month right now, October 2010, is actually the 30-year anniversary right, right to the month of the first recognized cases of AIDS. I think it's very important that we not accept this type of global catastrophe as something which is inevitable. We have to push forward to create systems which allow us to predict and prevent these kinds of pandemics before they occur. If collectively we're able to do this, we may be able at some point in the future to stop having to commemorate these kinds of anniversaries. Thank you.